You know, excited with a hammer, right? It's now 4.30. Well, I just saw way too many conversations. <laughs> All right, we're about to commence the September 4th, 2018 Port of Bellingham Commission meeting. Um, call attendance. Commissioner Briscoe. Here. Commissioner Shepard. Here. And Commissioner Bell is here. All right, we begin these uh, meetings with a, a public comment period. We're going to have two public comment periods, one at 4.30 and one at 5.30. We allocate um, about 15 minutes for these. You've got as uh, many as three to five minutes to say what you need to say. Anybody signed up for public comment? Commissioners, we do not have anyone signed up currently. Does anybody wish to speak before the commission? Everybody's on this side of the room. What do you guys do? Yeah, what, what's going on? <laughs> no shower, shower? What, what? These Axe body sprays now that you can. <laughs> All right, so we'll start with the uh, consent agenda. A motion to approve consent agenda items A through J. Um, anybody want to pull an item or discuss something further? My questions were answered previously by staff, so I'm good. I'm good. That's well. Um, I just have a couple of quick questions. One's on D and one's on F, and they're not deal killers, so I don't want to pull it from the agenda. I just kind of want a clarification if I could. Um, on the sprinkler system. I guess the question is sim a simple one for me is I wonder why this wasn't envisioned at the beginning of the project and or, or no it's different from that that's the next one um, are we going to see a revised budget because this is going to save us so much money it was promoted uh, you may depending what uh, what we learn in that uh in this expenditure uh, the the research uh, has been really fruitful for three of the uh we're doing three of the FMIP buildings, sorry, Adam Fulton, Director of Facilities, uh, building three and building five and building six. And um, as we get these professionals in and suddenly we re research it, uh, we learn a lot more than we're able to learn during the estimating period, uh, which is typically about this time of year for next year. And uh, so I suspect that we are going to learn something great about FMIP building one, and I hope that we're going to spend a lot less than our budget. Yeah, it's just a common thing to spend a lot of money to with the promise that we're going to see let's see this will save the project tremendously <laughs> over the original as promised and I just wonder if we see a revised budget at some point on on that kind of a promise yeah you will I don't know what a Your promise words are gonna come back uh, yeah to, right they're gonna come uh, back to bite you you know what we do uh, commissioner uh, is uh, we have began what we were calling a capital budget true up uh, about every quarter we, I think, hope to do that, um, as well as kind of actually visit our whole CIP program development. Um, we're sort of thinking about how to do that a little bit better through the year. But in any event, we probably still do some what we call true-up exercises, maybe quarterly, where uh, projects come and go for various reasons through the years, permitting or uh, the impotence or the, uh, in, the, the drive for the project leaves or a new project arrives or something else. And so we do a true up period where we come back to you guys and say, you know what, you approve this uh, capital improvement program budget, but it really needs to shape more like this. And uh, so, so I hope to, in that next one of those, I hope that this project is one of those where we say, hey, we're putting money back into the till. Does that help? Has it ever happened? Uh, I think we put a million dollars back in this uh, last meeting. From that, and so we would expect the same from this. I, I'm hoping. Yeah, me too. And that's my only. Maybe comment. not a million dollars, but yes. I, yeah. <laughs> On a yeah, I can see where it could. <laughs> I can see where it could. It's just that if it comes back and we've actually spent the same amount, then we've spent eighteen thousand dollars more to get to the same end point. You're, you're exactly correct, and it is a gamble, and the gamble has paid off so far. Yeah. Well, and we trust you. So that's. Thank you. All right. Thanks. F is kind of the same thing. Yep. Yeah. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> so uh, action item F uh, is, uh, I think, $4,900. What, what we're doing there is um, historically when we uh, 
did wetlands mitigation, you know, we were looking to fill a bunch of our wetlands along the eastern section of our airport for, um, for real estate development, such as the large parking lot that's on your right as you drive in, and such as for the hotel, um, these sorts of things. So to offset the, the uh, filling of those wetlands, we did a mitigation effort out on Slater Road, you've probably heard about. As well, the county required us to do various sidewalks and landscaping through the airport uh, proper, through the entrance road and such. So that was in two phases, phase one, phase two. And um, since, you know, and that was, I think this was devised six or eight years ago. And since then, the development uh, and master plan of the airport have changed. And so the, the sidewalks that we were gonna do uh, as made necessary by the county, really no longer fit what is going to be developed and what, and we, you know, we had side, if we built what was there, it was permitted, we'd be building sidewalks kind of to nowhere, which made a lot of sense back then because of what was going to be somewhere. So, um, so we're just revising that. Oddly enough, that made sense. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we're just revising the sidewalks and then, and then as such, the stormwater is affected. And so this is just a small PSA amendment to visit the stormwater report uh, to appease the county. Does that help, Commissioner? That's great. I apologize for not bringing that to you earlier, but... There's no problem at all. Otherwise, I have nothing else on the consent agenda. Thank you, Ed. You're very welcome. Diane. A, a motion to approve consent agenda items A through J. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay. Move on to action item one. Do we have presentation first? Or? Mm. No. Sorry, I wasn't reading the agenda. Presentation from AECOM. Sunil. Hello, Commissioner Sunil Harmon, Director of Aviation. Uh, before I turn the presentation over to Emily and AECOM, uh, I'd just like to say that our objective here today is to really delve into the recommendations uh, that came out of the master plan. This is a new master plan, as you recall. This was prompted really by the Federal Aviation Administration, even as they approved an update to the previous master plan in the summer of 2015, they realized that we had a safety issue uh, in terms of design standards that needed to be addressed. That was the runway safety area for the north side of the runway adjacent to Interstate 5. They also at that time were rolling out a need for all the airports to enter into agreements to do airport geographic information system surveys, uh, both on and off airport property, essentially to identify obstructions to new navigational procedures that they are effecting as we speak. This is all part of the next gen air traffic control program. Uh, and so where we could have gone and updated a forecast and come back with you to you with recommendations, we actually ended up having to do a new master plan. Fortunately, they paid 90% of it. Uh, this process has been extremely transparent. It has been interactive, both the Citizen Transportation Advisory Group, which is the BIAC, as well as the Airport Tenants and Partners, which is the Airport Technical Advisory Group. We have posted all preliminary draft, draft, and FAA-approved tasks as they occurred on the website. We've had a couple of presentations to you as a body, as a commission. And I think it's, it's time after 17 months that we roll this thing up, even as we have preempted some of the recommendations to get the runway safety area addressed. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Emily, who's been the project manager from my staff and done a great job in managing. And of course, John Yarnish, who's the program manager for AECOM, uh, and he'll be doing the briefing. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Emily Philippi, the Airside Operations Supervisor. Um, Sunil summed it up great of the kind of the progress that we've been making. This did start, you know, late 2016, so we're really excited to get this finished up. We're about 90% complete with this, so I'll turn it over to John as he has provided updates before, and myself, Sunil, and the rest of the staff are here for any questions that you have afterwards. Thank you.
Good afternoon. I'm John Yarnish. I'm with AECOM. Uh, we're in, the, in our aviation practice. Let me get this thing up and running. Okay, we're going to give a, a, a quick overview of the master plan that, that's been completed. Um, as Sunil said, it's been vetted and read by the FAA. So tonight we're going to talk about the recommended airport development plan. Um, some potential environmental issues that, that go along with the um, recommended plan, and then we'll present the airport layout plan. So, That said, we divide our, our recommendations into airfield, terminal, general aviation, and other. And here are some of the airfield projects that arose from the master plan. Um, as, as Sunil said, the runway safety area improvements are the top priority. Um, there are safety area, there are safety uh, related improvements. And then to put blast pads at the end of the runway, that's a paved surface at the end of the runway so that uh, the big airplanes that go out there and rev their engines don't blow, don't blow dirt all over the place. Also some runway shoulders. Uh, occasionally the outboard engines on aircraft will, will blow up some dust along the side of the road and uh, along the side of the runway. Uh, re realign the exit taxiways. The exit taxiways currently use um, what's, what is legacy pavement. So realign them so that the airplanes can get on and off the off the runway more efficiently, and then do some work with the uh, interior service roads, uh, the perimeter road, uh, the the road that the emergency service vehicles have to travel if something happens on the airport off the runway, and also to do some perimeter and wildlife fencing on the west side. For the terminal. Um, Mostly uh, relates to putting some uh, remain overnight spaces in uh, over on the uh, on the on the north north side of the terminal building, um, and then to have an opportunity to expand the terminal that in that direction in the future should demand uh, arise. Our, our forecasts show that this is not going to happen in the next 20 years. But the previous master plan showed it uh, extending in the other direction, which was causing some problems with the GA hangars that were down there and making them ineligible for, for, uh, for, for improvements and, and even maintenance items. And then the last is to put uh, a rental car QTA quick turnaround facility across from the uh, relocated rental car uh, ready lot. Um, General aviation projects, as I said, the, the existing GA um, hangars, FBOs, and all the uses in the, on the current apron are to remain. The, the, they, with the with the change in, in the in the terminal direction, these hangars will will stay and stay active. But on the other side of that, there's some area that's ready for expansion. Should the should the demand come, we, we're 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 Forecasting that demand will, will show up, and if it does, there's an area ready for that development. It's been uh, shown as ready for that development for quite some time. And then over on the west side, we provided an area for a logistics center, and logistics center is essentially a, uh, a cargo or anything that requires airplanes to come in, offload a, a piece of equipment, and, and then go out. So there's no... We don't know what the demand is, but it's nice to have the area uh, prepared for it. The other thing that we looked at over there was an innovation and technology business park that relies on aviation and has, a, has a access to the runways. Again, this is something that, that when you're marketing, you have the availability to have the land available for this type of activity. Other projects that we came that came out of the master plan, and these are just an agglomeration of ideas that were that were thrown around by both the public and the technical advisory, is eventually replace the airfield lighting with LED systems. They use less less power; they're less expensive to run. Develop solar energy systems on the airport. There were two two uh, areas uh, indicated in a previous study that were available for solar power generation. And we're tying those with expanding e-car e charging stations. What, what these would do is they'd provide a covered parking lot, but also they would, they would power some e-car uh, charging stations. We're recommending converting all ground service equipment that's owned by the port to electric units. Um, again, it, this is keeping with sustainability. Relocate the fuel farm. Um, the fuel farm just uh, is going to need more capacity 
and it needs to be relocated to a, to a place where it's more convenient and, and cheaper to operate out of. Eventually relocate the airport traffic control tower, um, get it out of the place that it is, get it to where it can see the whole airfield so that it, it's, it's in compliance with what an ATCT is supposed to have, and then to construct a new snow removal equipment building. Would that relocation include new equipment in the tower? Would when, it be a new tower? When, yes, it would be a new tower, absolutely. But, but remember, it's a, this is a, an FAA-controlled move, so they'll decide when it goes, where it goes, how it goes. But it would be... It won't oh. be in my lifetime. My grandson's got dibs on the old one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He'll be in his 40s yeah. by the time he gets it. I, I believe you'll be making this recommendation three master plans from now. But that's... Um, and then when we, we came up with all that, we, we looked at the airfield and, and all of the, the agglomeration of all of the recommendations and projecting uh, uh, related environmental issues. Um, a lot, um, almost all of them are potential wetland impacts. Uh, there's a lot of wet property out there. Um, when you start even uh, putting a new road in, you got wetlands issues. It's a design feature. You try to keep it out, but occasionally you can't keep it out. And so we identified it as a potential issue. <coughs> um, should the uh, logistics center uh, develop, there's the wood waste area out there that will have to be uh, mitigated, uh, moved, whatever. We're not sure which. And then on the uh, potential GA area, um, it's called Potential Site 45WH839. There's a pile of rocks out there that uh, years ago uh, an archaeologist uh, looked at, wasn't sure what they were, marked them as a potential, potentially being uh, important. But nobody's ever looked at them, has ever been able to say why they're important, whether they'll be important. So we're just noting that before anything happens there, someone's going to have to go out and make that determination finally. Then noise. Um, how's noise change? Well, on this map, you can see, a, I hope you can see a solid blue line. Um, there's a series of solid blue lines here that show the various um, decibels, uh, day-night noise levels that are associated with current activity. And, and we've got um, the 65. Within the 65 is where the FAA and, and the, the folks who regulate this say uh, impacts begin. Now, people hear noise differently, but this is, the, this is the area where we have to study what the impacts of that noise and whether there has to be any uh, mitigation. And I think the, the, the news here from this map is We've also got a dotted line that shows the 20-year forecast noise levels, and the differences are, are, are fairly insignificant. And let me go to the next. The number of housing units, and we did a windshield survey on this. There's 21 residences within the 65 uh, DNL contour. Uh, that won't change. Noise-sensitive facilities, as identified, there are none there now. There'll be none in the future. The rural residential land, the urban residential land, the light impact industrial land, and the general commercial land will all increase. But let me go back to the other so slide and show you there's, there's this thin strip outside the blue line to the, and that's where all of that increase is showing. It's not big parcels, it's, it's like 100 foot on, on all sides of the existing lines. That adds up to quite a bit of acreage over the time, but it's a long, it's a long contour. Why, why the thin strip of noise increase on an outside edge? Is there a... I mean, just with, with the, the, the increase in the number of airplanes that are forecast to come here. It's just um, the number of airplanes that's increased. It's, it's, it's a more of a time thing with noise than an actual level of noise. Uh, well, it'll be a, it'll be a, it's both, let's say. What we have in the future is a different, we have more airplanes um, that are forecast to come in. Now, they're, they've got different noise characteristics. They're, they're generally quieter. So over the course of time, there'll be more airplanes, but they won't make as much noise. And so what you're looking at here on the contour is a, is a day-night average sound level. And over the course of 20 years, that will not change significantly is what this is showing, using the, the computer modeling techniques that, that, that we use for that. So if I understand correctly what you said is, 
it's more flights, so we're going to have more noise at different times of the day is actually the increase, not the level of the noise of the plane. That's correct. Each flight will be quieter, but there'll be more of them. Right. Thank you. And that results in the airport layout plan. This is the uh, federally, um, <coughs> excuse me, the federally adopted document that comes out of a master plan. And what this shows in draft form that we have here now is all of the recommended improvements shown on one document. And this is the document that the FAA will sign and, and you all will sign as the guideline for future development of, of the airport. And then when Sunil or, or the airport goes for, to do a project, the FAA will look on here and say, well, it's here, it's been planned out, it's been well thought out, it's, it's eligible for 90% uh, for funding. Uh, I got this thing messed up. And that's it. Thank you. Any questions, comments? I just wanted to relay a couple of questions that came up at the last BIAC meeting um, for everyone's benefit. One was about the uh, location of a compass rose. Could you just walk us through where that would be and what are the complications with citing uh, that yes. feature? can do that. So a compass rose uh, basically is a pavement marked area on the apron, tarmac, or asphalt that allows uh, pilots to take their aircraft there and calibrate their magnetic compasses. Now the demand for compass roses have diminished over the years because compasses have become increasingly more sophisticated and electronic. Most of them are now sat-nav based and the need for a purely magnetic compass is continuing to diminish. Uh, the compass rose originally was located in the area that is the overflow. I don't know if you can see this or not, but um, yeah. So it was approximately in this area uh, where you see the purple line. Uh, Unfortunately, the FAA's criteria has become much more restrictive in the siting of compass roses. They can't be adjacent to any electromagnetic interference as well as any underground utilities that might interfere with a magnetic compass. So we did a fairly exhaustive study on the airport and couldn't identify a site that met the current criteria for establishing a compass rose. That's primarily because most of our airfield lighting system the wiring is copper, it's direct buried underground, and it creates magnetic interference, uh, electronic interference. So what we've done is identified a location just adjacent to the logistics area. Uh, unfortunately, to do that project as a standalone project for the four or five users that want it, we'll have spent uh, easily above half a million dollars in new pavement uh, to get out there. So it's in the master plan, it's been identified, but I, I see the market need diminishing. Uh, there are very few pilots today that insist that every airport have a compass rose. Now, many adjacent airports have compass calibration pads available that meet the current standard. They can always fly over there and calibrate their compasses. There's really no upside in terms of revenue to the port. Uh, the downside is a pretty significant investment to get out to a remote area that doesn't have EMI um, interference. Great. Is, the, is that Compass Rose available at, say, Skagit? It is. Great. Yeah. Thank you. And, and there are, I think, a, a handful of other airports within a short flying distance that have approved Compass uh, calibration pads. Great. Um, two more questions that came up at the meeting. Um, first, uh, there was a question about existing uh, GA hangar tenants and the ability to install solar panels on roofs. Is there, any, is there anything about the, our, the current regulations or the current master plan that prohibits that and is dependent on this plan being adopted or can a tenant move forward if they so choose? I think we wanted to, uh, first of all, through the approval and adoption of this master plan, get to a point where um, the FAA agrees that the general aviation hangers don't need to be relocated. 
the assumption was that they would be relocated. And that prevented a lot of the decisions with longer term leases and allowing them to do capital improvements and so on. I think the adoption of this plan will enable them to do those things and enable the port to enter into long term agreements. Great. And uh, last one, could you just walk us through what a RFP could look like for a wash down station. You you mentioned there was maybe a possibility of um, a an operator who, who might be interested in that. One of the requests I've had multiple times from members of the GA community is we used to have a wash down station, we eliminated the wash down station, and part of basic um, airplane maintenance is keeping your plane clean. So there's an interest in seeing that, and I appreciate that it's here forecast into the future. Um, and I'm just trying to wrap my head around how it would work if there was a um, operator. We uh, recently completed a FAA-funded apron re uh, rejuvenation or uh, improvement project in the general aviation area. So approximately it's located where the hangars are today. Um, So generally, it's in the area which we had identified for relocation in here. And the pavement work was limited to approximately the area that's identified. So in the course of designing those improvements, we actually designed a aircraft wash rack, which is an aircraft wash down pad that basically drains the, the water, separates it, oil and water separator, re reuses the water in a re recycling system, roughly a $200,000 project. We also looked at what the interest was at the airport. There are very few operators that are insistent on having to wash the airplanes. Typically, they're pontoon-equipped aircraft that are operating in salty, briny water that need to wash their aircraft off after flight operations. There was no return on investment that we could justify with that 200000 So the design is done. The site is identified in proximity to those hangars, and an RFP would look like an interest in developing and financing, you know, sort of a design, build, and operate sort of arrangement. But I don't think there will be many private operators that will be able to make that sort of investment and have a recovery on that investment. A, a typical washdown charge is you know, no more than $30, $40 per aircraft and there just aren't enough aircraft that would generate a return on a project like that. Yeah, makes sense. Did the previous washdown station have a fee for use? The, we never had a, a station for, f with fee for use. It used to be just a hose bib, and you know, we didn't comply with a lot of the stormwater standards and criteria that we have to comply with today. Um, the, the whole idea is that you don't contaminate adjacent waterways. Well, it's a you know, it's always nice to provide amenities um, at our at our airport to give our customers the best service. There's unfortunately not a lot of job benefits or revenue benefits with installate with that expense. So it would, yeah. and and we will leave it as a placeholder that that site is reserved for a wash facility. It's just a matter of somebody coming along and wanting to make that investment. And should our revenue situation improve over time, I think we'll go back and reconsider. Thank you. So if I did hear you right, Sunil, you said prior to the new regulations kind of being enforced or trying to comply with everything that the FAA has put forth, our, uh, our local folks that were flying just washed their airplanes like you wash a car in your driveway, correct? Basically. Yeah, there sure. was a spot where we made available a hose and a spigot, and a, you know. Trying to keep so it in one spot, right? In, in one spot. And, yeah. and because of our stormwater constraints now and so on and so forth. The, yeah, most of the apron today drains into uh, filter media that separate oil and, from water and then allow that water to go into you know, retainage areas or into the stormwater system. Uh, but this sort of activity, you're dealing with hydraulic fluid, you're dealing with... So, so they can't you know, wash their planes anywhere? Technically, it's better to just wash it on bare ground than it is to wash it because the, the ground actually traps a lot of the contaminants and, and doesn't allow it to seep into groundwater, uh, at least the heavier contaminants, fuel, 
and, and those other contaminants potentially. I think um, a, a wash rack is a good thing to have. Unfortunately, the economics here just don't, don't work. Uh, the FAA, of course, won't support it as a project, so they had it extracted from uh, the design process and wouldn't fund that improvement. So, but as it stands right now, no one has any place to wash an airplane at our airport, correct? Not in the manner that I is mean, prescribed. To legally be in compliance yes. with the environmental and stuff, you, we don't have any place for them to wash it, right? Yeah. We have some green areas, but they're not designated as wash areas. So. Okay. And I guess my only other question is, you as airport director, you're, you're comfortable with this design and, and you know the overall mass changes and so on and so forth? Yes, Commissioner, I've been involved in this all along. Uh, we've actually presented this uh, at just about every single advisory group meeting and with meetings with the FAA. We've submitted the documentation that leads to this. This is sort of the legal graphic rep representation of 17 months of narrative reports. Is this one drawing, this airport layout plan? It's the document that the FAA relies on to approve millions of dollars in federal funding and so on. And you're good with this? I'm good with it, yes. Okay, thank you. Can you do me a favor and go back to the sound? I just the have a real quick... noise contours? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And I'm more curious not about what we have control over, but what we don't have control over. So how far across the interstate, all of that is private property, correct? Yes. Um, as we Except go for the, the parcels that you see outlined, and which we are no airport. And those could turn, the zoning on those, does that give you any heartburn that those might turn residential or those might go in a direction that would impact us as it, an airport? It always gives airport operating entities, sponsors, heartburn. But one of our obligations is that we'll ensure compatible development. So it's, it's the obligation of the port and the city or the county, whoever has the zoning responsibility to ensure that they don't put in incompatible uses like single family or residences, multifamily and if homes we, or churches. Have we explored waivers for the sale of that real estate at some level so that a new resident comes in and buys that property? And I mean, that's not unheard of to have that be disclosed on the title that you're in an airport it, noise zone. And oftentimes when you have a formal noise mitigation program, you can't do a title transfer unless you have a deed of disclosure document as part of that transfer. And do we think that that's in place in those locations? No, it's not. We don't have a formal noise abatement program. Uh, it would be a buyer beware. You know, most people, um, you know, do their homework to see where they are in relation to it's airports. The ones that don't think. bother me. Yeah. Right. They're the ones who are going to complain. Yes. Not that I have personal experience with that. You won't complain, right? No. <laughs> No, but my pet peeve is in the garbage business, you have a garbage dump and somebody builds a house a mile away and they complain that the garbage trucks are coming by your door. The same thing happens at the airport. I'm sure they buy a house or build a condominium. And yes. All right. There's nothing we can do about that then. Not a whole lot. What we intend to do is share these these noise contours with the jurisdictions and, that's all and ensure property. that as they develop their long long range plans uh, that they will incorporate these as you know guiding documents for what is compatible and what's not compatible with the airport yeah that's all i have thank you any other questions i have i have none either. thank you sir. thank you okay we're now going to <clears throat> recess the public meeting and open a public hearing on the Bellingham International Airport master plan. Anyone wishing to speak on the master plan, now is the time. Anyone wishing to speak on the airport master plan? Oh, the crowd has diminished on here, mm. on this side, by one-third. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <Huh. laughs> <laughs> there we go. Increase. So we will now close the public hearing on the Bellingham Master Plan and reconvene the public uh, meeting. So on the action items. A motion to accept and approve the Airport Master Plan and Airport Layout Plan as presented by ACOM 
and authorize submission of the plan for Federal Aviation Administration approval. Any comments? I just says it's very obvious there's been a lot of work by staff, Sunil staff, and all the staff at the port that's gone into this, as well as other people, and it, it, it appears to me that, uh, that some of the changes have made are very good, and I think everyone has gone into in depth and everything to try to make sure that uh, this will do well into the future for to the public of Whatcom County, and uh, I'd like to commend everybody that worked on it. Yeah, well said, and and I've been attending the BIAC meetings regularly, and um, there's been lots of full disclosure about this plan. There's been lots of questions and comments and conversation about it, and um, I I didn't hear any opposition at any of those meetings to what we're moving forward with. So. Uh, yeah, good job by the by our team. I concur. So with that, a motion to accept and approve the airport master plan and airport layout plan as presented by ACOM and authorize submission of the plan for the Federal Aviation Administration or FAA approval. Mr. Shepard, aye. Mr. Pisico, aye. Commissioner Bell is an aye. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Huh? Um, before you go too far, do we know if it's a boy or a girl? Yes. <laughs> we didn't vote on that, though. No. But <laughs> you don't have. You don't have to if it's a girl. Oh. No. Oh. And only if it's a boy. <laughs> well, then I'll, I'll, I'll in favor. Aye. Aye. <laughs> Action item number two. A motion to authorize the executive director to execute a professional services agreement with Mead and Hunt to provi provide engineering consulting services in the amount of $103,795 plus a 10% contingency for a total contract amount of $114,000. Sunil. Commissioners, uh, this actually segues really well with the discussion that we've just had. And uh, actually, the ALP shows the runway safety area, but I'm going to go into a little more detail. Um, bear with me a minute. So if you recall back on the 8th of May, I believe, uh, you, as, as the commission, approved an interlocal agreement uh, for the port to enter into with the State Department of Transportation for a joint effort in finding the best solution to solve the runway safety area uh, deficiency. And uh, I have to say that, yeah, I've been through many of these interlocal processes, but the June 1 meeting that we had was an interagency meeting with the Federal Highway Administration, with WashDOT, with the port, and of course, uh, AECOM present, uh, uh, participating at least with material they furnished. And um, uh, all the parties uh, actually came in and spent a day in a very extensive planning workshop and identified two alternative options to improve the runway safety area. Uh, the preferred one was using earthen embankments, gradually sloped, both beneficial for highway traffic as well as airport incidences and occurrences. And the other, should that not work for some reason, if it's fatally flawed in some way, then to look at a more extensive uh, evaluation of a retaining wall uh, to construct the runway safety area. Each of those improvement options has a different footprint that would be acquired as a parcel within the Interstate 5 right of way. So the area that we're shown in red here uh, with, uh, to, be, to be acquired from WashDOT, we will have as part of this scope of work that was defined through that joint exercise, uh, we'll be able to define the exact extents and attributes of the parcel uh, that we will look to, to exchange with the highway, federal highway and uh, state highway departments. Uh, that prompted us to then go out with a request for qualifications uh, with engineering firms to do what the FAA likes to call advanced planning, 
uh, it's really preliminary design. They get into about 30% level of schematic detail to identify not only the, the best improvement, but also the impacts that that improvement would, would generate in terms of environmental wetlands and other safety issues. And as a result, we've successfully uh, selected Meet and Hunt. Because this is a federally funded project, in fact, last month, uh, actually earlier this month, you approved the grants that the FAA is providing for this, um, we actually had to go through an independent fee proposal to ensure that the fee we had, that we had negotiated was consistent with what FAA believed to be uh, the, the appropriate amount. And so uh, the federal share of that grant is 135,000. Uh, the overall contract is about 113,000. It's been independently verified, and I'd recommend you approve the award so that we can get underway. And the whole idea here is that this work will be shared very closely, both with federal highway and state highway, to, to ensure that we're on the right track and get a proper exchange of property so we can ultimately do this improvement. So this is the first step in a four-step process. Uh, the ALP gets adopted, which you just did. This study gets underway, and we have some identification of what is the better construction method to solve the runway safety area. And the th then we actually go into the environmental review process before we can get into design. That's why the FAA doesn't like to call this a design process, because legally they can't enter into a design process until the environmental review is done. And then the last phase is construction. So we're still looking at a three-year process as I, as I see it. Does this require a perimeter road? It does. Uh, within the interior of our, whatever property we, we exchange or take, acquire th from the right-of-way, we'll not only have a security fence, but it'll also require the extension of the interior service road, which is a controlled access road in order to allow both aircraft rescue firefighting vehicles as well as security and operations vehicles to get in there. And uh, it, it is within the runway safety area, so they have to be in active communications with the tower when the tower is operational. Does that count as part of the runway safety area? Yes, okay. it does. We actually are on the runway safety area. Okay, got it. Okay. And we're out of compliance as long as until we get this four-step process completed, yes. correct? Yes. Well, you know, the easiest way for the FAA to solve this problem, which is what they were pushing us towards in terms of expediency, was to shorten the length of the runway. Now, that would be economically detrimental, so I kind of pushed back really hard on that, that, you know, that was a non-starter from the beginning. And uh, so we, I think we've, we've got a very constructive group of people in this, you know, uh, you, you, when you have four agencies together, you know, the best you can hope for is to make some sort of an average kind of sausage, but this, was, this outcome was amazing. So I just want to keep the momentum going. And it's just maddening what it takes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's all a process, isn't it? Yeah. Will we be trading for some property somewhere else or buying this? Or what, uh, what they, they haven't talked about trade. They've talked about acquisition at fair market value. So at some point, we'll do an appraisal. And uh, they've also talked about ongoing maintenance. But for what we gain, I think it's worth it. And it'll be federally funded. So any acquisition that we do will be an exchange. Uh, any, con any idea what the four-step process will take in the way of time? Three years. Until, for this? Until, no, until we get into construction. This, this scope of work I'm just, is... It, I'm yeah, incredulous. Four months. Yeah. Such a huge piece of property, though. <laughs> I have no further questions. I have no other questions. I feel for you. <laughs> I have no further questions. A motion. A motion to... Approve or authorize the executive director to execute a professional services agreement with Maiden Hunt to provide engineering consulting services in the amount of $103,795 plus a 10% contingency for a total contract amount of $114,000. Commissioners, all in favor? Aye. 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 Special award for patience. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. 
have the patience of a snail. Okay, action item number three. A motion to authorize the executive director to execute a professional services agreement with K Engineers Incorporated to provide engineering consulting services for the Bellingham Shipping Terminal Repower Warehouse One and Berth One project in the amount of 28000 plus a 20% contingency for a total contract amount of $33,600. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Adam Fulton, Director of Facilities. This is taking place at our shipping terminal. This is a plan view of the, of the terminal. Just to orient to everyone, out along this side is the waterway, and there's our wharf. Over here is Cornwall Avenue. Uh, right here, north of straight up the page toward the log pond and Georgia Pacific property. Uh, the master plan for the property uh, is two things. One is to put underground our power supply, which uh, is currently overhead right now. The reason for that is uh, to allow uh, north-south movement through the, the property uh, when, when, for instance, the log pond is more utilized for cargoes, etc. cetera. Uh, we won't have overhead lines to contend with. Uh, to date, uh, the, the second thing we're doing there is to uh, revisit the amount of amperage we have available for docking ships and to our warehouses. So to date, what you see is this, um, these, this shown by this red line, and that is, those are currently conduits uh, that are underneath the, the ground and ready to be built uh, or connected. What you, uh, this green uh, here would be where we would be designing Again, more underground, and then that would be replacing, the whole thing then would be replacing this white dash line, which is currently an overhead line. So this PSA before you is simply a design uh, PSA to design this green underground, as well as then size the, uh, the system and the amperage of the system to supply what, we've, uh, what, are needed, what is needed out here on the, uh, at the dock. Commissioners, have any questions about that? I do. I have a couple. On the <clears throat> over by the log guard where our power ends, there, that's not where we're pulling our main. That's not where our main central for power is. It. It is not. Uh, the the main the connection is actually back here, and then the overhead line runs like this. So ultimately, we need to get from this location to this location. What you're seeing here is. Uh, just a little stub of power we had to run for the barking operation for the, the logs that were there. And uh, the green is going to be the rest of the underground stuff that's going to connect us up. And are we going to remain the white line that's going to remain overhead stuff? So that'll all stay there. It's not going to be changed at any point in time? Well, the idea would be to get rid of that overhead and, and feed it all underground so that we can uh, run again north south through here with uh, taller, uh, you know, we, right. we were thinking of module construction, this sort of thing. We simply had no way to utilize this part of the property because we basically had a clothesline in the way. I was, I was speaking, Adam, further out to the road, the railroad tracks there. Oh, yes, yeah. you bet. We're, gonna, we're not going to change that at any point in time? You're correct. The commissioner's correct. This, this is uh, scheduled at this point to, to remain. Why would we not change that to all underground everywhere while we're doing this? Well, we sure could, and it would be uh, down in that in that area. It would be purely aesthetics. Uh, again, the the functional thing we're trying to accomplish is to not have overhead interference uh, running north and south through the shipping terminal site. Um, that would not be the case down here. However, again, aesthetically, it might be nice to put them underground, get them out of the view. And all we've got to do in the red is pull the lines now? Those are all set up just to pull the wire through? The commissioner's correct. Okay. Thank you. And is all of this compatible with the schematic that Tier is interested in pursuing for their um, rail spur? Is that on the same location here, or is that in going to be in a, in a completely different spot? This would this would not interfere with any uh, any um, future plans for rail through the site. Okay. And there's no reason to believe that we should put that underground for aesthetic reasons. There's no there's no danger there of a tree coming down or. And there's already a bunch of other wires in that area. That's where the Puget uh, Power Co facility is, and there's a whole mess of wires on the other side of Cornwall. So I think even if you clean up that small space, you're not really not a lot of benefit from that. We're not going to lose power there anytime soon. Okay. All right. 
Okay. Motion to authorize the executive director to execute a professional services agreement with K Engineers Incorporated to provide engineering consulting services for the Bellingham Shipping Terminal Repower Warehouse One and Berth One project in the amount of $28,000 plus a 20% contingency for a total contract amount of $33,600. Commissioners, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> you leave and look what happens. It's just a third, of the, third of that side left again. I was on the other side. All right, presentations, economic development update. Mr. Colbert. This, this might take more than 10 minutes, so you want me to go straight through the 530? Got 11. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, otherwise we've got to sit around and wait for 10 minutes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Don Goldberg, director of economic development. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, we're, we're here to talk about uh, economic development, what the team has been doing, uh, what our plan is, and where we're heading. Um, we're going to take this presentation out to the small cities, county, city of Bellingham, and uh, a lot of our partners as we move forward. If you notice, I have a quote, a ship is safe in the harbor, but that's not what ships are for. Uh, I'm going to begin this presentation with that, and I'm also going to end it with that, because I want us to remember that economic development is for the long haul. There are times in which you're going to have rough seas. You are, uh, there are going to times where things don't work out, but if you're well prepared, uh, you have a good ship and you have a good crew, you make it through the hard times and you work towards uh, a long-term goal. And I think one of the things we haven't done in this region is think that way. Often when times get rough, we uh, let go of our plans and we, d we don't see the long-term. So I want to emphasize that this is a, a long-term plan we're working on. So what, what's the vision? Uh, the vision is to strive to be highly pro programma programmatic, as I was mentioning before. Uh, we're, we're an opportunistic business, but it's time to be programmatic long-term. Uh, we want to uh, uh, retain and attract livable wage jobs and to assist businesses, entrepreneurs, local organizations, and to thrive for the entire, to thrive, uh, organizations to thrive for the entire Whatcom County region. Uh, so, what we do, we promote Whatcom County as a great place to live, work, and do business. Um, we connect our businesses with economic development services and skilled workforces. We work with our partners in Canada to help enhance our cross-border uh, trade opportunities, which are great and are, are increasing. We uh, cre create and facilitate living wage jobs. And we organize and implement a countywide real estate vision, which I find uh, to be lacking in this region. We're, we're highly opportunistic in our uh, real estate, and I'd like to bring the team to focus a, a true vision for the whole region. So the, our uh, economy and trade sectors, we work very closely with our regional partners uh, to create this vibrant community. And some of those partners are higher education. Um, in higher ed, I'll give you some examples of some of the things we're doing. So um, in higher ed, we're right now working with um, international business students at WWU for a, a potential project uh, to research industrial properties on both sides of the border. Uh, what connections there are, whether there are companies on, in Canada that would like to locate here. Uh, what are the pricing differences? What are the benefits on either side? And the, uh, the head of the business uh, school there on international studies has come to us and asked us to uh, put together a, a program for one of their senior groups. Uh, on agriculture, we're working uh, on a future berry lab that we're supporting out in the county fairgrounds to help support the future agricultural business in the area. Um, high tech, we've uh, helped a local company grow and work through some very uh, difficult land use problems that have allowed them to stay here, to hire more people, and are considering growing additional jobs. 
Um, of course, uh, one of the marine trade deals that uh, we helped facilitate that um, we just saw another launch is All-American Marine Expansion, and they're doing extremely well. Um, manufacturing, uh, I can't disclose the name of the company. It's called Project Sapling right now. It came to us from Commerce Department. Uh, it was a project that was worked on before I was hired. It went dark. It came back uh, about eight months ago. And it, we've been uh, helping them facilitate the possibility of bringing this company here. It's a joint venture between a Canadian company and an American company. The president last week told me that they've signed the deal and they are coming here. They're taking down one of the, the largest built building here outside of, of ours. And they expect to bring 100 uh, good jobs to the region. Um, recreation. Uh, recreation area, um, uh, North, uh, Recreation Northwest and a couple of the large recreation manufacturers and I have been getting together and we're really starting to talk about getting recreation clusters so that the manufacturers outside of this region know uh, that this is a great place for them to do business, not only for them to use their equipment here. Um, energy, of course, we have uh, iTech, which has uh, been a great success. We've uh, introduced them to the Lummi tribe recently, and potentially there's a partnership uh, for the Lummies to distribute uh, iTech product uh, across the Indian nations uh, for solar. Uh, that would be a win for not only um, the Lummi tribe and the region, but one of our local manufacturers for them to grow their business and employ more people. So uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, but all of these we are hitting on and we are actually uh, performing on, on multiple uh, levels on each one of these. And, and, um, and then our last one, if you notice, is emerging markets. And we always want to be open. Uh, we don't want to be so focused that we're not open to new things. So we're always looking for what's next. Can you give me a feel for what you see as an emerging market, a couple of places where you see emerging markets maybe? Yeah, so uh, in the marine trades, each one of these areas um, can have some, some sub-areas. So one of my interests is in marine trades, connecting technology to marine trades. We have some marine trade technology companies here. Some of them are owned by other companies, so hybrid and electrification of uh, marine vessels is something that I'm highly interested in. I've talked to Matt at... Uh, um, um, at the uh, All-American about it. And, uh, and so that, that's one example. Um, uh, another example would be how do, we, how do we get the manufacturers here to manufacture products that, um, as I was mentioning with Canada and the US, uh, some of the companies sell the majority of their prop product in the US, but they're making it in Canada. So now they're starting to look at the visions of products that will that sell more in the U.S. and bring the uh, the manufacturing to the U.S. to avoid um, some of the tariffs and, and tax benefits. So um, and uh, some of them are are very small but uh, big in scope. Um, the Blaine area is losing its last doctors, and uh, and so they have a pharmacy and Birch Bay has the doctors. I'm working with those doctors to expand that facility into a more central place in Blaine where there'll be doctors that can uh, service the entire region. And in addition to that, I'm working with a micro hospital to potentially open a 20 bed uh, hospital facility up there. So people who had a minor injury or needed to spend the night for a small surgery wouldn't have to come all the way to Peace Health. So if you're in uh, Linden or in uh, Blaine, you'll be potentially able to uh, stay up in that region if you had uh, stitches or something of that nature. So, so we have to connect, uh, you know, uh, sometimes a small win is a big win for, uh, for an area. Or could help with infrastructure to get put in to get get that off the ground. Is there any way we could um, the, the hospital uh, and those facilities? Right now, inf infrastructure is uh, we haven't identified an actual site for it. We're working with the city of Blaine, the county, and uh, uh, it's really good news because two weeks ago, after about six months of working with Family Care Network, 
Uh, they have committed within their organization to uh, move forward and open up a bigger facility. So now I'm just helping that they're in the beginning stages of uh, looking for the site. Uh, I've given them some sites to, to um, question. And, uh, but uh, at the utility stage, if there's a great site that they find and we find that uh, there needs to be infrastructure, then there's a, a potential EDI or something fun that we might be able to help with. Do you know in, in, uh, in, in the quest for getting this facility up there, do you know is there an inclusion for blood work labs and things like that so people from Linden and Blaine don't have to go to Ferndale or Bellingham to get their, their blood work done? Yeah, so um, the two different pro projects. So the Family Care Network is uh, planning on making uh, it uh, similar to their Linden facility, which has about uh, six or seven doctors and a lab. So that's, that's their goal. But uh, if the micro hospital facility can be put together, which would also bring economic benefits from uh, Canadian uh, medical tourism potentially, uh, they would have uh, x-rays and uh, it would be, a, a, as it says, a, a full hospital just on a small scale. Thank you, Don. You're welcome. And I think my question was a little bit <clears throat> broader than that. Are we looking at artificial intelligence type um, facilities and, and things that are in the future? Sorry. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I see those as. Yeah, no. Well, um, you know, our, as, as I move forward, the, our, part, care about artificial so our partnership, say, for instance, with higher education, as you know, we're also That's working with go. Western on the Western Crossroads, uh, a six acre site down on the waterfront. Um, and I think we all support that, that that facility will be the jobs of the future. And so uh, I know uh, I strongly talk to them about cybersecurity and the importance of having that hub down there. I also know that Whatcom community uh, is also interested in locating down with them on that site. Um, to me, that would create the hub for private sector to um, locate all of their cybersecurity offices around it. So Microsoft may not open a 2,000 person facility here, which we couldn't handle, but we would love to have 50 of their cybersecurity specialists here. And so, yeah, that's, that's yeah. all heavily being looked at. <clears throat> that's, that's really my point, is little niche markets where we can truly have an impact. Exactly. And, and by di diversifying it, we don't have the uh, negative impacts if one leaves. Uh, we can ha if we have cybersecurity with 15 companies of 50 people each, that's much more powerful than having one company with 750 people. And I, what I also like is in addition to those market sector emerging markets, you're also thinking about geographic mm -hmm. uh, diversity too. And you know, just today, Don was at a meeting where we were, I wasn't able to attend, but we've been putting together a group uh, for the last a couple months to look at uh, economic development opportunities in the Kendall region, mm -hmm. and um, it was a very productive meeting from what I heard. And you know, it's it it's part of just sh us making sure that we're assisting and um, giving attention and giving expertise to these projects. We don't always have the silver bullet solution, but uh, we are um, really stepping up and and making sure that our our partners out there know that we're interested in helping. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, our team is constantly emphasizing that we are countywide, yeah. um, and, and it's the outlying county that needs more help. And so uh, I, I believe they're, they feel like they're being heard. And I may be stepping on a later slide, but real estate availability for housing, is that something coming up or is mm -hmm. that something you want to address now? It, it's, it's coming up. I'll wait. <laughs> So uh, the foundational steps that we're taking, uh, first foundational step was to create a team, which we're in the final steps of. Uh, we've taken our time to do that. Uh, John Michener, as everybody knows, is here. Gina Stark is also here. Uh, myself, and we're in the process of hiring our fourth FTE. Uh, we've been very mindful not to do that quickly. Uh, it's the most expensive part of our budget, so we want to make sure that we know what we need. and. Uh, that we're mindful about our budget. So uh, we're in, uh, hopefully, uh, deep into that fourth person. Uh, that FTE will be a person that specializes in technology and uh, recreation, 
but they'll also have to be able to do everything because the way our team is formed, uh, we overlap. We have about 50% of our responsibilities dedicated to our own job. And then the other 50% overlaps each other as a team and we are prepared to do each other's jobs and sit in to do what's necessary. So if that technology person needs to get out to Linden to talk berries, they're gonna have to do that. So, um, um, so that we're, we're very close to getting a, a fourth person and then we'll be closing that up for a while. Uh, we're, we're all very busy, but we have a, a great team so far. Um, learning, of course, we've mentioned a little strong partnerships. You're, you're much more strong by uh, bringing in others rather than separating yourself. So we have a very open door policy. People know where we are now and they know that we're here to listen and to learn. Uh, and then we're identifying our strengths and weaknesses. You can't make good positive changes if you're not willing to really reflect. Um, and then the last thing, of course, is we need uh, consistent long-term funding so that we know we can uh, plan for the long haul. Um, so our strategy, economic development is more than a business of retention, expansion, and attraction. You know, there's the quality of life. Uh, there's uh, listening to your community, and it's uh, weaving all the merits of your community together. Um, our vision is driven by the vision that the city of Bellingham and Whatcom County have done massive studies on economic development, uh, comprehensive plans. Um, I remember when I was, being, when I was interviewed, uh, the county asked me, are we going to be updating our 2016 um, or 18 uh, comprehensive plans, and I was like, we have enough plans, somebody's actually got to implement them. So that's, that's our plan. We are in the process, we just are finishing a white paper um, and this presentation, and every, all, most of our actions are based upon what the comprehensive plan suggests that we do, and now we're implementing it. Um, and then our go goal is to bring up public, private sectors uh, in the creation of an economic roadmap to di diversify and strengthen this regional economy. Um, we want a diverse economy. We want one that uh, is able to hold up to the storms that are waiting out there uh, in long-term planning. Uh, ADO, we're the Associated Development Organization. We're one of 37 ADOs in the, in the state. We report directly to the Washington State Commerce Department. Uh, we provide follow-up to uh, commerce leads. Uh, the, the Project Sapling was a commerce lead. Uh, and uh, we report to the Commerce Department, Department quarterly. As of this time, we, uh, uh, we report on number of contacts, people that have contacted us, deals. Uh, we're exceeding all of the numbers that we're, we're required to uh, um, report on. Uh, and then we received partial funding as the ADO. Uh, I believe this year was approximately 96,000. Um, typically, this is called BER, business, uh, uh, B, business retention and expansion, uh, but I see it as RER, uh, retention, expansion, and recruitment. Um, it's often everybody believes that recruitment is the way to expand your economy, but recruitment is a shotgun approach that has very small benefits, especially to a small community. So it's not to say that we're not trying to recruit, but our energy is much, much more in the retention and expansion mode. And so we're trying to, first of all, retain the companies that are here. Um, there are companies all the time. One of our major companies here was just purchased by Mercury a month ago. So there's, we want to make sure that when a company is purchased that the mother company keeps the local company here. We also want to facilitate growth, um, whether it's uh, Alpha Technologies or iTech. iTech's in an expansion mode again, and if we can help them grow even more with the LUMI, they'll have more expansion needs. Um, and then uh, assisting with finding uh, locations and permitting uh, and connecting the groups uh, with workforce. Because uh, it's not only that we need jobs, we also need people to fill those jobs. Uh, the expansion part, of course, is a little bit of what I was just saying. Uh, we, we want our buildings, uh, businesses to be successful 
and in their success, they'll grow. Um, and then uh, we are also operate the Revolving Loan Fund, which is a tool that we've used to, uh, with great success on small businesses that have really helped them out. And then we're going to use our target markets to, to recruit. Um, and um, we're going to always be, as I mentioned, open to new markets as they come aboard. Quick question on the workforce. Yeah. Um, I see a really changing demographic in the workforce, and I'm just wondering what you, how you characterize the availability of the workforce here in the county. Where are we lacking? Where are we strong? Um, where do we need help? Uh, it's a big deal for me. Yeah. Um, we're having uh, the nation, you know, uh, six years ago, this conversation would have been about what are we going to do about our 10% unemployment? And how are we going to, you know, get jobs for people? And now we're the nation in many places, including here, is having that opposite conversation. We've had such a good economy that we're having a real difficult time finding uh, good employees. Which kind? That's really um, where I want to Well, it's across this. the board, I would say. So we have everything from problems on finding construction workers in the area to high-tech people to cybersecurity. For instance, the cybersecurity that we were talking about before. Professors of cybersecurity make substantially less money than the graduates out of their classes. So, um, so there's a difficult time on getting cyber, good cybersecurity professors because they're in huge demand at, at high pay uh, on, on one extreme. And then you have um, just uh, day laborers or workers on the beginning, on the low end of the pay, that we just don't have enough. And a lot of the companies that uh, have those type of jobs complain that they only have one requirement, and that is that they pass a drug test, because often it has to do with uh, labor. And, uh, and some of the companies say that they have a 70% failure rate on that. So, um, so we're, we're really... Uh, in need across the board of, of just about every type of employee. Some of the things we are doing, and tomorrow I am moderating uh, Whatcom Community College's um, sister city thing on uh, business, and uh, part of that conversation will be what is Bellingham Tech and Whatcom Community doing to facilitate the, the worker, the needs of the workers for the future, those jobs and the degrees of the future. Because we, we need to look at what are these jobs that are coming up and how can we facilitate the schools, whether it's uh, the university or college, to accommodate that, uh, those degrees or uh, certificates so that we do have that workforce here. So I, it's, I'm sorry that it's not a direct answer, but we're, we're really hurting across the board on, in terms of all employment. Yeah, I just have a built-in bias towards uh, skilled labor because I see such a huge shortage in skilled labor. Mm -hmm. and, and that comes back to your other previous question about housing yeah. uh, because they're, they're interrelated. Let's go to there. Um, so uh, marketing efforts. Um, so we're, we're marketing uh, this as a great place to live, work, and do business, which it is, and we're trying to make it a better place because that is part of our mission. Uh, we are going to, and we're in the beginning stages of uh, creating a countywide economic brochure. This is, uh, the purpose of it is to, again, unite the tribe, you know, to, to get all of our differences to be our assets. Um, I, I don't see whether it's uh, beliefs, political systems, or specialties uh, uh, being different as being bad. I think it's our asset that our county has so many different uh, attributes. And if we are able to organize them into a fabric that is strong, it will bring us long-term uh, growth. So uh, we're, we're creating this brochure where it'll be a, a small brochure printed and a big brochure digital that will allow each of the region, cities, and uh, districts to write their own economic development paragraph and include some pictures of what they think is the best reason to come to their community. And then we'll unite that whole thing in a countywide brochure. Um, we're working, we're sponsoring uh, a lot of events uh, that have, we think, benefits. So uh, tomorrow we're sponsoring the Sister City uh, 
where seven sister cities from around the world are here. Um, the next night, we're sponsoring uh, TAGS, uh, Technology Alliance Group's uh, um, scholarship fund. Um, so we're, we're trying to be involved with as many organizations as possible. Um, and, uh, and we participate in uh, quite a number of panel discussions. And then uh, media, uh, we're not spending a lot of money on media. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of, uh, um, I don't think, dollars to, uh, uh, support from it. But, but we did recently, the Bellingham about a month ago was um, on uh, KCPQ. Uh, we put together, uh, in two days, our group uh, put together a, a great 15 second ad that ran, I think, 20 times. Uh, it really showed the airport, the marine terminals, our land, and the things that we did. I, I thought for the money, it would have cost us more just to put that together. And now we have that on Team Whatcom's uh, website as well as the Port's website. So, um, and then uh, some of our partners that we work with. We're working a lot with higher ed. We have uh, technically there's four colleges and one university. Most. People think it's three in one, uh, but we're working with all of them. Uh, we're working heavily with all our government agencies. We're uh, um, all the chambers, a lot of the nonprofits, business organizations, uh, local community groups, uh, the tribal nations, and uh, we are letting everybody know that we are open for business and we are here for new partnerships. Um, then uh, how are we gonna grow this economy? Well, the first thing is, and this relates to what you were saying, uh, Commissioner Bell, is we need infrastructure in this county. Uh, we need to create a long-term plan as to how are we going to, wh what are the most important sites? How are we going to facilitate utilities and infrastructures to them? Uh, how are we gonna put that money aside? How, where do they connect? Uh, nobody has done that work, and so I am, uh, hopefully going to be doing that this coming year where we do infrastructure studies that find the primary sites that are here for development, both industrial and residential, because the reason that more houses aren't being built here is not because residential builders don't want to do it. Between the land costs and the infrastructure costs, it doesn't pencil out. And when it does pencil out, it pencils out at prices that we're seeing that doesn't facilitate low price housing for workers. So uh, it's a very important aspect of what I believe we need to do. Uh, and then broadband, of course, uh, that's uh, another infrastructure. I personally believe that broadband is a utility that we should take as um, a, a required utility, no different than water or electricity or sewer. Uh, broadband is not the future, it is the present. And uh, we hopefully will have uh, some of the outlying schools and areas that deserve to have broadband uh, getting it through the port. Uh, so our team is working uh, on do, uh, facilitating that. We're the foreign trade zone operator for the entire county. There's one foreign trade zone that's live right now. It's in Cherry Point at BP. Our airport is, uh, the entire airport is a foreign trade zone that's not active right now. Uh, and then we can activate any foreign trade zone in the region. Um, and they're becoming much more popular again uh, between uh, the economy and what's going on throughout the world in trade. A lot of organizations are starting to ask questions about foreign trade zones again. Um, opportunity zones, uh, I don't know if uh, you're all aware, but uh, the federal government uh, basically came out with a new program for opportunity zones. Uh, we were given uh, the opportunity to have three zones, including the Lummi Nation. We supported the Lummi Nation on their application, and then there were two other zones. One is uh, most of downtown, and the other is the waterfront. And uh, what Opportunity Zones allow is an individual or even a fund to put money into that and invest in that region without uh, having capital gains. It is a potential huge aspect to our waterfront in downtown. Um, and uh, we will be facilitating, hopefully in October, um, a presentation by the federal government here that will go over what the program is and who can qualify 
and we'll be inviting both the public agencies as well as the public itself. Um, and then uh, Cherry Point Business Park. I think it's an asset that uh, we have focused on in the wrong way. We have taken it uh, on extremes. There's the environmental side, and then there's the fossil fuel side, and we're forgetting about the whole middle. And the middle of that project is um, regular industrial buildings, distribution buildings, potential solar field, wetland mitigation. Uh, we are missing the boat there. And, uh, and so I'm right now working with uh, planners, developers, both on both the Canadian side as well as our side to uh, master plan the potential cherry point to bring in uh, what I think could be a, a game changer for this entire region. Um, and then, uh, and, and that, uh, the last one, cross-border business, we're seeing a tremendous increase in interest from the north. Uh, Canada has uh, lower BC, Surrey has very little uh, industrial product left. There, the price of industrial property there is more than twice what it is in Seattle. So uh, they're looking for land and they need uh, places to grow. And we're the only major border crossing uh, in the United States that doesn't have an international business park. Um, so I hope to change that. Uh, next steps, I-5 corridor infrastructure analysis, as I mentioned. Uh, rural, rural broadband rollout, emphasize rural Whatcom uh, County's economic development. Uh, as uh, Commissioner Shepard mentioned, we're meeting with the small cities and region, uh, working closely with Lower uh, British Columbia, Cherry Point. Um, I am, uh, uh, we're just beginning a new county committee called uh, Commerce and Business Committee that I facilitate. Our first meeting will be September 18th, where the, many of the leaders of our biggest industries here are part of that committee. Um, we're, we're working on cybersecurity recruitment. We want to support the waterfront, and, uh, and we're going to continue to expand our strategic partnering. And, and then I, I say once again, the ship is safe in the harbor, but that's not what ships are for. I, I hope that uh, we will not act in a fear-based model, that we understand that hard work takes a long term and commitment and dedication, and that we're here to accomplish big things. So that's it. Any questions? Go ahead. I'm gonna, I'll start out by just saying I love where you're going. Thank you. How's the Barry Lab project coming? Well, um, Slowly. <laughs> um, I, I don't know exactly where it is. They're out raising funds right now. And, and we have uh, committed uh, uh, some funds for them for the next year. Yeah, there's EDI money going in that. There's port money going in that. Uh, we've got port. What we did was we met with the uh, small city mayors and talked about them giving up uh, their fund this year to go to that. And uh, they reluctantly agreed to that. Uh, we're also going to come to you with some uh, decisions about that fund in the future. We think instead of, you know, in the past it's always worked out. We've had eighty or $100,000 and someone's got 10, someone else got five. We think it may be more beneficial for them to kind of take turns on it and someone gets a bigger chunk each year and then, you know, maybe Lyndon gets it one year and then Ferndale the next and blame the next and so on. And they seem to like that idea. So uh, year one, we're going to push towards the Berry Lab. But there is EDI money going in that. WSU has significant money in that. And I believe the project's going forward. Good. I think it's a good project. Um, the county council stuff, uh, all the hubble about there at Cherry Point, is that going to bugger up what we'd like to see going out there when you were speaking to? Because I think you hit you hit what needs to happen out there right on the head. They need to quit for, forget about the water access and forget about the other stuff and move ahead with, with jobs. Yeah, I, about three weeks ago, the county had a, a commission meeting on whether they should ex extend the current uh, fossil fuel ban. And, and I was there for all three and a half hours of that conversation. <laughs> and, uh, and there was, I believe, about 60 people who got up and spoke. Uh, I'd say 25 on either side were um, 
supporting their side. And then there was a small group of five to 10 people that were really focused on what they should have been, which is, so what are we going to do here? Right. Um, you know, we, we're, we've, we've spent a little bit too much time trying to uh, shut the other down rather than solve the problem. And um, so I, of, of course, Cherry Point, uh, my career has been pretty much made on taking up projects that others told me I shouldn't. Um, and, and I think Cherry Point right, right in there. Um, you know, the county is uh, afraid of it to some extent. There's been a lot of hostility. There's a lot of money spent. There's a lot of time spent on that project. But again, I think they've been trying to focus on the wrong, asking the wrong questions. So if this doesn't work, what should we do? I, I suggested even that uh, we take the non-developed land and we remove it from heavy, heavy industrial and make it into uh, regular industrial zoning. So we leave the existing uh, fossil fuel industry in a heavy zone and we remove the super heavy zone from the rest of the land so the, the community that's afraid of what's going to go there uh, and we don't need to put all these different layers of conditional use permits and everything on things because developers and users won't go if they don't know if they can go there. Uh, it'll satisfy some of the people who are afraid of additional fossil fuels and it'll start uh, working towards the future. Um, I, I met last week with one of the largest land developers in British, lower British Columbia and uh, the company that actually designs the, their, their business parks. And I presented this whole thing to them and they're, they've already uh, talked to SSA. They're, um, they're very interested in, in pursuing at least looking at it. Uh, we know it's long term. There'll be a lot of infrastructure. Grandview will have to be expanded. Uh, uh, but that's why it, nothing's being done, because it's so big that uh, we're not implementing a long-term strategy. And, and so that's what I'm hoping to do. You want to be careful in this job, because if you make too much sense, they'll try and shut you down. Well, when I was going through interviews, I had, uh, my, my girlfriend said to me, are you sure they're ready? And uh, I said, I'm absolutely positive they're not. <laughs> uh, well, I hope we can be wing, wind beneath your wings, because... Uh, I love the strategy, number one. The, second, the first question I've got on that, is a down zone required to do that? Do it's you, actually an up zone. An up zone to move it from heavy industrial to... Yeah. Um, I believe it, what we can do is create a sub-area plan. So instead of making it Cherry Point, I, I say we should create a Cherry Point International Business Park within there and zone that separately. So maybe on a sidebar, you can tell me why that's an up zone. Uh, we don't need to do it now. Yeah. So the, uh, <laughs> the opportunity zones. Yes. The opportunity cost makes it an up zone. Yeah, anytime you go to a zone that has more potential uh, for revenue and all, so commercial would be at the top of it, you know. So the opportunity zones, uh, Blaine's included in that, I, I, I would assume? No, so opportunity zones are only, we were given two small uh, districts. So, uh, and they were basically, uh, they emulate um, new market tax credit zones. So they're federal zones. And um, so we just happened to have two red zones uh, and, and those were the two that we wor worked on. Uh, and red being the ones that have the highest chance of getting approved. And so, and the reason Waterfront and Downtown did is it's based upon taxes and uh, Downtown has a huge amount of students that hit that population, so it lowered the tax revenue base. And then of course the Waterfront is uh, in, in transition, so it didn't have a bunch of revenue there. So um, a great example, if you know Portland, the Pearl District, which is one of the fanciest areas now, and it's the new downtown, that was a new market tax district where for the first 10 years, people weren't paying taxes there, and it's the most expensive area uh, because when it started, it was not. Uh, and that's the goal. The goal would be to do such a good job that we're, we're no longer uh, need that kind of benefit. But uh, we are working with Blaine a lot, but uh, they were not part of uh, a new market tax credit area. 
Okay, so for clarification, when you say waterfront, we're just talking about the waterfront district. The, the, the new waterfront not area. Waterfront. Yeah, not the entire waterfront okay. front area. Yeah. Okay. So a question on a meeting on the 18th. Interested in that meeting, but wouldn't be able to attend because I'll be sitting in this chair. How is it that some of this stuff seems to come up and it's just, it's, it's right during our commission meeting we have to have? <laughs> I mean, I, w I would like to see some, maybe some foresight from, from folks when they're putting these meetings together that will affect the port like this, that we'd well, be, we'd be allowed to get to it because we're, we have to be here. So, so the, um, in the future, if, if you could, folks could think that, you know, the commissioners might like to attend that. So uh, the, the meetings will be at from noon to 1.30. So um, uh, they're meant to be luncheons so that we can help accommodate uh, the business people that we're inviting. So, uh, and they are open uh, meetings for the public. Okay. So, so they won't, they should not interfere with this meeting. As long as you don't have any big plans for like a, a really long exec session. No, no, sir. Would you send us an invite? To that? One of the reasons we do schedule in those days is because at least previous commissions like to block that day out and do a lot of commission work on that day. So we, we had it earlier in that day, so then you could come from there to here. It was my assumption that it would probably be later, like the, most of the ones. That yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Don. It's uh, really exciting, and um, I'm looking forward to some of that visioning process with uh, the other opportunity zone at the Lummi Nation and just really getting our heads wrapped around what some of the opportunities there are for us to work collaboratively and uh, apply some of these resources and, and utilize that federal um, designation. Okay. And given the warning, are you still with the girlfriend? Because <laughs> Well, it's more whether she's still with me. Yeah. Uh <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to make sure that you, you, you didn't I, destroy I, that. I went down there for the four days. I had to put my time in. <laughs> I had one one clarification thing, Don. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm not sure if I heard it correctly. In our workforce problems we have, did you say that 70% of the folks that are interviewed for jobs on our, in, our, in our present workforce or, or they don't? Pass the drug test. Seventy percent. No, I said up to seventy percent of some of the jobs some that people are uh, applying for. Some of the companies told me uh, directly their their presidents and senior that they're they're they'll take almost anybody for some of these jobs, but they have to pass the drug test, and up to seventy percent are failing. And that's really sad. And for my positions, I'm right, right at fifty nine, almost sixty percent failing. It's a dismal state. Thank you very much. Thank you, Don. Hey, Don, you're doing very a good. great job. Thank you. I am thrilled. Anything we could do to help? Yeah. Just ask. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We got your back. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're now going to break for, um, you guys need a break? Yeah, I need a break. Yep. For about five minutes, we'll come back for another um, public comment period, and then, so at 10 after 6, we'll reconvene.
Okay, now we've got another public, uh, public hearing session. Anyone wishing to speak before the commission? Now is the time to do so. Anyone wishing to speak? I'm mad as hell. I'm not going to take it anymore. Me too. Okay. <laughs> no one wishing to speak, so we'll close that session and move on to the next presentation, which is airport rules and regulations with the best airport director in the country. Sunil. Uh, I just briefly introduced and handed over to Aaron Collins, who's been my project manager on this. But if you recall, um, a little more than a year ago, we adopted airport minimum standards. Airport minimum standards are what informs tenants and parties doing business on the airport on what criteria they have to meet in order to be uh, uh, permitted operators on the airport. Many of the airport minimum standards referred to rules and regulations that were well outdated. Um, and so as a result, both the BIAC and TAC wanted the airport to start updating the rules and regs. So we, we actually began this process over a year ago. And it became uh, a fairly um, involved process in that we went through numerous iterations and updates. We, I think we went to eight editions of the airport rules and regs. And most of the, the ambivalence uh, from the tenants was that, you know, it basically addresses safety, security. Airlines never really had a big issue with it. There was a small group of people in the general aviation community that felt that these rules and reg regs were actually encroaching on their rights on how they can use their hangars, particularly hangars that they had constructed on port land with their own money. Uh, the real simple explanation here is we're a federally obligated airport. The federal government gave us the land to use as a public use airport. As a result, we're bound by the FAA's requirements with res respect to types of uses that can occur in a hangar. In fact, we're required as airport operators to inspect hangars to ensure that they're being used for aeronautical purposes. And so a lot of the pushback was, well, what if we want to repair airplanes? What if we want to construct you know, experimental aircraft. Uh, you, you're inhibiting our ability to do that. Uh, that was not the intention here. So we went through and uh, actually referred to FAA's definitions on what is preventative maintenance, what is overhaul maintenance, and so on, to, to try to narrow down from a life safety standpoint what sort of uses they could subject their hangars to in terms of aircraft maintenance activity and what things were prohibited. Finally, we got to a, a standstill where a couple of people, primarily the experimental aircraft type, said, well, you know, what if we wanted to construct new, new airplanes, experimental aircraft and hangars? We actually then uh, identified an approach where they can seek our permission and approval, but they have to involve the fire mar marshal to ensure that they are actually addressing the fire safety and other life safety requirements. Many of these are storage hangars. They're not designed to undertake those sorts of activities that might create a fire hazard. So we brought the, the fire marshal's approval into the process. But to make a long story short, this is a regulatory requirement for us to have an updated set of rules and regs. And what brings us here today, I think, is a culmination at the last uh, airport advisory committee meeting with the representative from the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. Uh, this is a national body that several of the GA pilots had complained to about our process. The rep actually said our process was one of the best he has seen, one of the most transparent, one of the most cooperative in terms of engaging tenants and community members. He wanted to make it a model for other airports on how to update rules and regs and actually issued a letter, letter of support because we wanted, we actually Commissioner Shepard attended that meeting where he said, you know, we need to get this in writing. And we actually sought a letter from them and they submitted a letter. So I think uh, Aaron's done a really good job in getting us where we are. I think we're really close to adopting this plan. So, but this is a workshop presentation. There's no action required. And I'll turn it over to Aaron Collins. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil. Uh, Aaron Collins, General Aviation Operations Training Supervisor. He pretty much summed up my whole presentation here, so we'll go through it anyway. 
Okay, starting off, we'll do a, kind of an overhead look here. The purpose of rules and regulations. Airports administer policies, procedures, rules and regulations, basically to protect public health and our operations. We do this by restricting activity that we may see as hazardous or may affect the operations of the airport. Pretty basic stuff. We also have rules and regulations in place to indemnify the port. So why now? As Sunil stated, we are a federally obligated airport and we're required to maintain a current and reasonable rules and regulations. Our rules and regulations that we're operating under today were approved in 1997. That's 21 years ago. We're in the post 9-11 era. We have security regulatory requirements we have to address. Uh, we also have FAA policies. I mean, things have changed a lot in 21 years. Uh, Sunil mentioned the minimum standards for service providers. That was approved by this commission in October of 2017. They work hand in hand. They complement each other. So once we uh, updated the minimum standards, we're updating the rules and regulations. So let's talk about the timeline. Our first draft was released to the public for comment in November 2017, 10 months ago. Since that time, sequential drafts have been released to the public over the last 10 months using this public comment. We've had over 10 public meetings to discuss the rules and regulations. During these meetings, there were the BIAC meetings and the TAC, the Bellingham International Airport Advisory Committee and the Technical Airport Advisory Committee. During these meetings, we were able to examine the content, open up the room for dialogue with the GA tenants and other public um, folks that attended the meetings. So again, we had 10 meetings. We plan on having two more in September. So the key players in this review process was, of course, the BIAC and the TAC, and we mentioned them. There's also the airport stakeholders. Once a month, we have a standing meeting at the airport for airport stakeholders. Draft rules and regulations has consistently been on every single agenda. We use the Whatcom County Fire Marshal's Office as a resource to understand the International Fire Code, how it affects our facility, our hangars, the fuel farm. We also use the FAA. TSA, Department of Homeland Security, of course. And Sunil mentioned the Aircraft Owners and Pilot Association. They are a political advocacy group for general aviation with over 400,000 members nationwide. I believe we have approximately 10,000 here in Washington. So that was an excellent resource to use. Finally, we have the Port Legal Department. We, we never really send anything out in the world until the Port has a the Legal Department has a chance to review. Okay, uh, industry uniformity. When we went into creating these draft rules and regulations, it was very important that we had consistency among the industry. So we reached out to airports in the region, the state, and across the nation. We looked at their rules and regulations. We found out the ways that they mitigated their hazards. They addressed these regulatory issues. And we add them as appropriate. So finally, the progress. Commissioners, you see a lot of green check marks here. First, the commercial terminal stakeholders. That's the airlines, that's the concessionaires, car rentals, other businesses. No objections with the fifth draft of the rules and regulations. Port Legal Department has had a chance to do their review. They have minor changes, basically just to uh, strengthen that uh, indemnification. As Sunil mentioned, the AOPA did send us a letter of support. Uh, I believe the language in it was this was the most tactful and diplomatic process that other airports should emulate. Our advisory groups, we have the BIAC committee, they have no objections with the fifth draft. Our TAC committee, we have been working through the, uh, these issues with them. We've had some great dialogue with the TAC. Um, two weeks ago, they passed a resolution. It was unanimous that the port's moving in the right direction, that we're almost there. So commissioners, in conclusion, you can see this has been a very transparent and collaborative process. The Aviation Division feels like we have created a, you know, a document that we can be proud of that's, that's fair and protects the public asset and the community. Um, we're going to issue the sixth draft of the rules and regulations in a couple weeks. Uh, shortly thereafter, I hope to have the final draft in front of you for approval. All right, any questions? Yeah, um, I've been trying to follow this issue quickly, partially because I was a bit ignorant on the topic, and um, second, because I've gotten a lot of folks, particularly in the GA community, um, requesting our, our attention to this issue and making sure that we are 
doing everything we should be and we're incorporating all the diverse wishes of our large group of people who use our services here. And in attending these meetings, I, I really do feel that we've gone through the right process. At the, I, I thought you might have some of those slides of the, uh, the proposed changes mm -hmm. and then what we actually adopted. Aaron had a really nice presentation at the last BIAC meeting that r showed what our current um, rules and regulations state, what people have been asking for, and what we've moved to. And in most every case, we have addressed interests that community members have, have sought. We've actually relaxed some of our rules in terms of what they were previously to allow additional maintenance operations to be undertaken. Um, and I think we've really taken the right approach with pointing to those agencies that are the regulators to make the, make the determinations, pointing to the FAA for, they're the final say in these things. And so we shouldn't be superseding and we shouldn't be below um, the requirements of the FAA. And the same goes for the fire marshal. Um, and so I think you guys have done a really good job pointing to both of those. And in that letter, I just wanted to call it a couple things uh, from that letter. You know, it said that this was from the, um, uh, his name is Warren, Warren Hendrickson, Hendrickson, Northwest the Regional Manager. AOPA. Yeah. And he mentions that um, it is a culmination over nine months of collaborative, transparent public process to ensure the final uh, document meets the needs of all parties. There's been a lot of hard work and dedication and attention to detail. And he in particularly calls out the uh, work by uh, Mr. Collins and uh, with our AOPA Airport Support Network volunteer, Mr. Robert Powell, mm -hmm. as being really instrumental in getting us there. And so I, I understand that it's never going to meet every single person's interest, but it, it did pass that BIAC committee, and I, I really do think we've taken the right approach here. I'd love to see us find a solution for that washdown. And if, if you, if Sunil, you and your staff believe an RFP will be successful and will get proposals back, I'm more than happy to entertain that. I'm also more than happy to entertain opportunities for a special fee structure from those tenants who are utilizing the services and would benefit from those services if that is as badly as this is wanted. So um, I'd be happy to support you in either of those directions because um, I do want to make sure that people are, feel like they're getting the, the services they, they expect and need. Yeah, and one of the things, commissioners, that my, my four supervisors and I, they're, you know, we're a team, we work together. Uh, one of the things that we've kicked around is once the FAA approves the airport layout plan, we're able to then get into negotiations for long-term leases for the general aviation hangars there are ways of funding those sorts of projects through those leases. We could have a surcharge added to the leases for a wash facility if they agree. Uh, we could have other means of funding it with higher, higher rental rates and higher land rents and so on. That, that's a possibility. I think an RFP at this point would not get as much by way of interest because there just aren't enough aircraft that need the, need the amenity. Thank you. And then, no, Sunil, what about the, the bigger, the larger aircraft, the personal stuff we're talking about, entertaining it, that other, um, there's a business coming in, I've forgotten how we spoke about it last year, I believe, that they were going to rent out here and uh, air, they are going to repair the planes for private. Yeah. The bigger stuff. Yeah, the, the larger, we're still marketing the old uh, Washington Air National Guard site. The, we're waiting for an agreement that will allow Department of Homeland Security to construct some new facilities. Uh, the Bellingham Aviation Services principal has been in talks with Homeland Security because that would be a privatized development. And when you get that sort of synergy, what you saw in the general aviation expansion area in the previous presentation, I think you will have enough critical mass to sort of justify a aircraft wash facility. That was my question, is if, if that would bring enough, yeah. enough uh, mass to make things work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
had a couple other questions. Yeah. Oh. Right. Um, the OP, AOPA, to use the, how many people in our GA belong to that? I mean, there's got to be a sector probably doesn't, probably doesn't. Aaron does. said about 10,000 oh, in no, this no, area. No, I mean right in our airport. Oh, within our airport. Our guys that have hangars. You know, uh, not all of them belong to AOP. Right. Many of them belong to the Experimental Aircraft Association. Typically, aircraft owners and pilots are ones that actually buy and and operate aircraft that are registered aircraft for uh, more than themselves. You can carry other people. Experimental aircraft, there's certain restrictions on certification and type certification. But AOPA has been around for, for a long, long time. It is the national agency. I think easily 50 to 60 percent of our hangar tenants are probably members of the AOPA. Of course, the fees, as the fees go up, and they have been, uh, you know, they splinter off and join EAA or uh, the jet operators that we've, a few of them belong to the National Business Aircraft Association, the NBA. Typically, you don't see them belonging to all three. But I would suspect at least half of our uh, conventional GA hangar tenants are AOPA. So how, how many percentage-wise, how much opposition do we still have to the rules that you have in a new draft? Very little. Very little. There, the opposition was four or five individuals uh, all along, and uh, you know they, they wanted some things in concession, okay. and and we can't make those concessions without creating economic hardship. So okay. we don't want to come to you unfunded projects. We've got an unfunded list already. Right. These would be added to those unfunded projects. The, the calibration pad is just not possible with the new criteria, uh, given the geometry of our airport and. And the wash facility, as I said, it there just isn't enough business out there. Take those two out of the equation. Is, is everybody, nine, we got a 90% everybody I happy with just it? about it. Aaron goes to all of the Whatcom Pilots Association meetings. We have support there. I, I really haven't heard any objections other than the, the handful that, that we've tried to address through this process. Okay, thank you. Yet. That's it. I'm done. I'm good. He can go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, mine is just a point of curiosity. Um, the the little boutique things like the San Juan Airlines are they doing very well? Are they San Juan finding Airlines success? Changed ownership is trying a more aggressive approach, uh, and I think they're having some success just based on the summer activity under new ownership. Uh, San Juan is also a good partner with us on the the AirFest event that we're having on Saturday. Mm -hmm. So uh, they've actually proffered some free tickets um, to fly to the San Juans as giveaways. The radio station is actually advertising that right now. Uh, I think generally the activity during summer tells us how, how the GA is doing. And this summer they've done well, but we've had a long, nice, dry summer. And typically that's when flight activity spikes and tourism to the islands, you know, intensifies. So good weather definitely contributes to um, the smaller operators doing well. Okay, thanks. Yeah, well done. All right, I have nothing else. Anything else? Okay, so I'm gonna start with the uh, advisory committee meeting schedule. The Marine Advisory Committee is meeting Tuesday, September 11th at 6 p.m. at the Harper Center building here. The Technical Airport Advisory Committee is meeting Thursday, August 16th at 9.30 a.m. in the ARF Conference Room on Baker View. The Bellingham International Airport Advisory Committee is meeting Thursday, August 16th at 5 p.m. in the ARF Conference Room in, on Baker View. With that, I'm going to ask... I'm sorry, maybe we could get a correction on the next TAC and BIAC meeting dates, please. What? I have them as August. You just read them. I'm... September today. Oh, I have them as September August. 4th. Oh, <laughs> you commissioners, oh, yeah, I have September 13th. Thanks next so much. Thursday. <laughs> See, I didn't even notice that. Thank you. I was, in, I was in robot mode. <laughs> they work very well. Intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now let's move on to other business. Do you gentlemen have any other business you'd like to bring up? I just have one, -ish, one item. Yep. Uh, I've, I've been getting some inquiry about uh, dry stack storage. And I know we've done some inquiry in this in the past, and I was wondering if um, 
we could get a little bit of a, just a real quick update of the, the history of where we've, our conversation has been in dry stack storage. I know we have a 2001 era study that we did internally that looked at that. And um, I'm interested in seeing if there's, uh, this is a, a right time to think about updating that um, plan in process and, and see if this is something that we can move forward uh, into our, our budgeting period. Uh, I think there's lots of opportunity. Everybody I hear from is interested in the dry stack storage. Um, there's, it's one of these things that if it was a slam dunk, we, somebody would have already done it before. And I, I would really like us to just m get the process moving along a little bit more to determine what, what are the next steps and uh, what is possible here. So the, I've talked a little bit about this with Shirley and uh, with Brian Gowern. Um, we, we've got a couple ideas. Uh, just you're correct. The last study was 2001. Obviously, very dated. Uh, the biggest uh, dilemma you have with dry stack storage is you got to find a space that's suitable, suitably big enough to house something similar to maybe the Twin Bridges facility or slightly smaller. But you still have to be able to launch the boats. And that's where we went into some difficulties. You know, we go around our harbor and we look at Fairhaven. We think that'd be maybe where Building Eight is on the industrial park. You could do something in there, but you can't cross the tracks with that many boats, so that precludes that site. And then you get into this. You know, maybe over to our marine trades area here, and they seem to be pretty confined for space right now. Although we want to open that up in the future, and we have some ideas for doing that with inclusion of the ASB and maybe some other businesses that don't fit down there. Uh, that's where we think the best opportunity is. Uh, you, otherwise, you get up north here, and uh, there's just not ample space to do that, either for launching the boats or space to build a facility. So what I'd like to do, uh, Commissioner, uh, is include this in our ASB talks, because we think that ASB talks includes more than just the ASB in that marine trades area. We can figure in that area for other uses, and some of the suggestions for that area are barge terminals, hatchery, and this dry stack storage. And we think all those uses might be compatible with each other in that area if we can acquire some additional land. So I think it's premature to do it for the 2019 budget, because I don't think we have a location or a way to launch the boats, but I think it's something the discussions need to start on now so that when we're looking at these future uses of these areas that, that that's top of mind I uh, I would be think? for doing a study on at any point in time on dry stacking you know, actually in, in my opinion that'd be a waste of the taxpayers dollar um, I think we have a company in Blaine if I'm not incorrect is supposed to be moving forward with a dry stack storage it might set a good example of something that could be done down here by a private private company I mean you've got mm got that but you've got Seaview North that has the facilities on the south side and they have a facilities over here there's there's companies around I think that if we if dry stack storage is that readily needed that may be able to take care of that those applications for, for folks I, I, I don't think we need to study that I don't think we need to spend however many thousands of dollars it takes to study that I think that we a waste of the taxpayers dollars yeah, as I said, I, I, and also, you know, I came here to put people to work. I don't think dry stack storage just puts very many people to work. A couple of guys with a forklift. We don't have enough property. The port doesn't own enough property on the waterfront to be, you know, putting it for dry stack storage. Um, if people that, like I say, that have proper property presently the least from the port would like to put a dry sack storage up I'd help them in any way shape or form we could but I, I don't I don't believe that uh, taking port property and setting it aside for dry sack boat storage over putting a business there and putting people to work would be a very good thing I, I, I don't believe that and so, Commissioner, you're talking about uh, Sundance's lease up in Blaine, and they have the option to do dry stack up there. I believe they have five years to make that come to fruition. So um, that, that may bode well with the timing that we're talking about for cleaning up the ASB and see how that business takes off. It may be a good example for, for us here. Okay. Um, do, we, do we not think we're going to need that pressure relieved on our marina here? I mean, I, I support it in, in Blaine, but I feel like our, our pinch point is here, not in Blaine right now for space. 
you know, I, I think it's premature to tell on that. I think how we reconfigure the harbor when those inner harbor floats are, in, in, are needing to be replaced and we have some dredging to be done there uh, is a time to start looking at that. Uh, we know we have demand for the bigger boats, the boats that can't go into dry stack storage. What we don't know is how much demand we have for the smaller boats. Uh, in my time here at the port, we've seen the demand for the smaller boats drop off drastically as people have taken those and put them in their backyards. Whether they put them in a dry stack storage facility, that's something we're going to have to do a little work to find out. Okay. All right. Well, that's good feedback. Um, we'll, uh, I'd be happy to keep thinking about it for future, future locations. And um, any of those existing operators who are interested, uh, it's, a, it's a, I think, a good opportunity for someone. You know, lots of boat owners like the idea of having that option. There's certainly other ports around that are providing that at I think with with success and space constraints is going to be our biggest hurdle you know just uh, Blaine has space and we don't and that's one of the reasons it's moving forward up there yeah. and one of the folks that uh, you know I mean shoot I forget the name of the place down at the end of the street there past Bornstein's Jesse's uh, oh Hilton Harbor there yeah, yeah. Uh, bitter end boats yeah, bitter end boats you know they've basically got a dry stack storage but it's one level so maybe those folks uh, would entertain that idea and maybe we would have to maybe help in some way to uh, with a building or such to do so so I, I mean there, there's folks around I think that could could entertain what you're you're you know and I understand there probably is some you know when you look at Hilton Harbor it's pretty busy yeah. um, but once again I, I reiterate we really don't have enough property to put more people to work here we need everything we've got and I'd hate to see you know, jobs going away for a boat sitting on a trailer somewhere or sitting on a shelf. I mean, folks, you know, have got one that goes home and goes in the backyard. So, I mean, yeah. it's, it, it's, it's, it's as, as Rob said, a lot of that's taken place. But and Bitter End did study this, uh, and they hired a consultant to do this, and he paid money for that consultant to look at, and the consultant shook his head and said, it's not going to work for your facility. Now, I haven't read the study, so I can't say whether it was too, not enough space there or his launching wasn't efficient enough or what that, uh, the demand wasn't there, but uh, he certainly has that study. Do we have that? Okay, we can distribute that to the commissioners so you can read that. Yeah. And I think theirs was a lack of space. I think okay. if I remember our conversation, Shirley, there's lack of space there. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to see how the private sector responds to the, to the issue first. And then I also think we're going to see a demographic shift in the next five years um, <clears throat> where I think boat ownership is going to become less and less mm -hmm. and more timeshare type ownership is going to be the, the rule of the day where people will be Ubering basically on a boat. I think Paul Sorensen referred to that when he That's came and talked to you. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I tend to think we're going to see a demographic shift, and so yeah. we're going to see the need decrease, and I'd hate to put resources towards something we see as a declining market. Something, I, if I could bring up before I forget, and I forgot when Aaron was uh, at the podium. Knowledge. Can I get a copy of the presentation that uh, Commissioner Shepard referred no. to of, of the, the rule changes? and, and uh, Absolutely, Commissioner, we'll send that out. Okay, very good. Yeah, I'd like to have that before we vote on anything to do with the rules. We'll distribute that to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other business? That's it for me. I have one. Oh. I actually have two. Uh, the first one is um, the logo redesign. I want to bring that back up. Um, I would love to help Mr. Goldberg out by reshaping the branding and the marketing of the port. Um, I still think that looks like we're surrendering when I look at the logo. The white flags. As we're flying the white flags over whatever it is we're flying them over. Um, and I do think the port may be in, in need of a little bit of rebranding, and it wouldn't hurt us to maybe take a look at it. Somebody so, thinking Jolly Roger? Well, I just think Jolly that Rogers. they're, they're so, putting stuff over the rampart, and we're saying it's over. So uh, I was kind of thinking the white flags uh, well, and it's, that we were surrendering to the public of Whatcom County and the transparency. So I'm not opposed to a logo redesign or a new marketing effort. I, I have not assigned that to Mr. Goldberg. Uh, I think well, I, I am opposed that to going to economic development for several reasons. One, um, three, two other governments in the county pay for our economic development effort. And I don't think they're going no. to take too kindly to And you misunderstood what I, I was basically saying. I want to give him a hand by redesigning. I don't know what department it goes to, but okay. I think we can help him out by changing the look and changing the marketing of what we do so that we put on a better presentation as the port 
Um, I don't think it necessarily belongs in his hands. That's so, so you know, we all got to vote on that, right? Yeah, I know. I okay. Just, just, just what's this one? I just think it's. I think maybe it's time to maybe take a look at that if you're of a mind to do that. I don't think anyone is in love with our logo. That being said, that changing a logo is a huge effort. All the business cards, the envelopes, the letterhead, everything that needs to go with that is a big cost. So uh, if we do go down that road, I'd like to see it be a very organic effort where we maybe have two logos for a while. A little bit confusing, but uh, to do it overnight, I think, is just cost prohibitive. And then I'd also like to see it be almost like a, uh, a community contest type of a thing where we get some input from people in the community as to what it could look like. Um, I was thinking an American flag with a state flag under I mean, it. <laughs> I have no argument with either one. I would just like to start the process. I think you could of, do that with a sharpie. Because I'm a, that's what I'm thinking. I'm a big fan Can't? of mark. I'm a big fan of sharpies? marketing. <laughs> and I believe I'm seeing a lot of support from your other two commissioners here. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of something from my other two commissioners. Um, but I do believe that marketing is a key component to no what question. we do. And Agreed. I think it, it's more than just a logo. Yes, you can do a competitive thing, but I think there's a marketing effort that needs to happen to maybe rebrand the port mm -hmm. to talk about what we have going forward. When when I listen to him talk about where he's headed, I'd like to have the port represent that in our image. And, and it's not just in our logo. It's in everything that we do. It's in the way the trucks look as they go down the road. It's in all of that. So I'm a big fan of marketing because I think it does a great deal towards attracting people to the community. And it it's a morale boost. Um, when I look at the Bellingham Airport logo, I love it. I mean, it speaks volumes, and it looks like it's forward-thinking. But we didn't. That was not a professional effort. That was an in-house effort to do the uh, the fly BLI, I believe. Don't tell me you did it. Yeah, so I'm going to take this opportunity to actually help Rob. We actually did it in-house. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, it was it was done uh, using various people throughout the port that have expertise in graphic design and and social media. Um, so we took the best that we have out of IT and out of marketing and, and developed that logo. And I think an organic effort is the best way to go with some yeah, I don't see my job as being to tell you how to do it. I'm just saying let's get started on something. That well, what, what, if we, what if we did what the airport did with the economic development department? Why do we have to change the port logo if... If we're trying well, to... And Don's working on his own, you know, the, the Whatcom County marketing effort. It's not just a port marketing effort. It's a community marketing effort. So that, that'll be something completely separate from our white flags here. Right. And that wouldn't that... I mean, that, to me, would be better than trying to market the Port of Bellingham. We're just going to have one flag. <laughs> one white flag? Or? One white flag. <laughs> just bigger, so right? So we're just going to surrender. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're saying is I give up. But it would strike me that if, if that that's the we want to draw the attention to the economic development department. And if we just change the Port of Bellingham logo, we're not doing that. We're not we're not we're not advertising the economic development growth department. I'm just I'm just saying it's, it's throwing something out there. It would it would make you know it is a lot of money to change everything. Signs everywhere, everything. It's just not just not a few business cards, it's our signs we have everywhere. It's 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 fairly expensive, but if we're going to market Don's department. No, that wasn't the intent to market his department. I think that's his to do. I'm just saying from the port perspective, when you look at ports around the state that have redesigned and reconfigured their marketing department yeah, and redone their logos, things, yeah. all of those places say the morale, the energy, the excitement, the attraction has been greater. Um, there are just certain things that say stop. But you know, if we saved, took the money we were going to spend on doing that and spread it throughout the staff and pay raises, I bet you get a hell of a lot more excitement about that than the change of logo. I'm just saying. So, and that's why I think it needs to be an organic effort. I'd hate to see us hire you know, a big consulting company to come in and do that. I think it's an organic, you know, local, like, like the airport did. We can do that. And Don certainly will be involved in that. I just I don't want to talk to the mayor and the county executive about why Jack is changing the white flags. But I'm, I'm definitely not repeat what Bellingham did with hiring a big out-of-city yeah. um, graphic designer who produced a logo that nobody liked and they had to can. And then and and start I'm not over a, again. I'm not a micromanager. I'm just saying, how do we start that and let's get going down that road because I think I'd like to see something. I think Bobby's got a good idea about Don's department is a good place to to test run a, a, I, a new logo. In three or four years, I've never seen David raise his hand to speak. All the time I thought those were sales going up the mass, not flags. They are. 
to someone's eyes. That guy's not going to go very far with that sailboat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that being said, that's really, I, I'd love to see you go in that direction. Then do you have a report on that Summer's End concert? Uh, we're going to do a report on the concerts on September 18th. Okay. And uh, talked about what we'd like to do for next year with your permission. So No concert? Uh, I mean, no, no riot? It was a concert? There was a concert on uh, August something. Um, no riot. No riot. No. 14th. No. 14th, yeah. Okay. Just let me we're going to report, report back on September 18th. Did you go? Huh? No, I was designing a logo oh. in my basement. You were looking for the pants. I'm waiting for the contest to come out because I'm going to win whatever it is. <laughs> All right, with that, any other prize is going to be an old port T-shirt with the old logo. You know? <laughs> <laughs> any other business? Meeting adjourned. <laughs>